All right, here we go. Oh, that's very loud. Okay, amazing. Hey, everybody. Welcome to this talk about UVs. Uh, my name is Jonathan Lampell. I work for CG Cookie, and I'm here representing them as well as Orange Turbine. Um, on the Orange Turbine side of things, we uh, help studios and businesses start to use Blender, and that involves often uh, Jason making a bunch of um, pipeline tools. And so we uh, took the add-ons that we had been working over on CG Cookie and moved them over um, to that side of the business because it made a lot more sense. Um, and so I've been working on a few add-ons recently. One of them has to do with UVs. And so today I want to talk about the things that I've learned about UVs while I've been making that um, and how to speed up the workflow. So I will be talking about the plugin a little bit, but mostly I want to talk about the ideas behind it. And so hopefully some of those might even be able to be implemented into Blender. Um, but Blender does UVs a little bit differently than other software. And so I want to talk about the specific workflow that Blender has and how to use it as quickly as possible. Um, who here loves UVs? Okay, like a couple hands. Shockingly, shockingly more than I thought. Not bad. Um, most people do not. And so I feel like anything that makes the process a little bit easier is definitely worthwhile. Um, also, it's almost Halloween, Halloween weekend. Uh, so I figured a very spooky topic would be in order. Um, I was going to wear a Halloween costume, um, put it in my suitcase, but then uh, I realized it was missing. And uh, I think I forgot to pack it. So, eh. All right. So the reason I'm talking about UVs is because um, I worked on a project a little while ago that involved um, some hard surface game assets, packed a bunch of them together. But this was back in Blender, um, let's see, 3. Uh, no, 2.6. And so I ended up doing uh, all of these by hand, which um, was very painful. And so since then, I kind of had a notebook of like all the things that I wish UVs might be able to do, and then just slowly added to those over the years, and then eventually was able to finally do something about it uh, earlier this year. Um, but it's been, it's been years of just collecting little things that I wish um, I could tweak. The first thing that made this so much easier than having to do all of this um, back in 2.6 is multi-object editing, not a UV-specific feature, but this actually uh, makes it possible to do a whole lot of things. Um, specifically packing multiple objects together, which is something that you couldn't really do before. There was an add-on for it, but it was very, it was a weird workflow and sometimes broke. Um, so being able to just select multiple objects, go into edit mode, uh, makes things much easier and is crucial for the material-based, texture set-based workflow, which we'll talk about. Also improved packing in 3.6 uh, by the developer Chris Blackburn um, is just phenomenal. It's so much better. Um, it's very, very good. It's not quite as good as some of the alternative packers out there. Uh, UV Pack Master is still king of all of them, um, but it's very, very good, and you can get a, a good pack just by default in Blender now. Um, so these two things made it so much easier, and instead of spending days on UVs like I was doing before, um, I think I spent a total of like three days unwrapping and packing that thing. Um, previously, now you can do that much more quickly. But first, why do we even need UVs in the year of our Lord, 2023, like it seems like a very old technology. Why do we still need to, to use these things? Um, but it's incredibly simple, and that's exactly why it works. So first of all, procedural textures. This is an example from my coworker, Kent Trammell. Um, this is a fully procedural wood shader. So it's like you can make some pretty cool things with procedurals, but a long list of instructions for the computer is always going to be slower to compute than a pixel telling it exactly what color it should be. Like it's just always going to be very resource intensive. Um, and you can't really do that in a lot of real-time applications. Also, a lot of uh, procedural textures still need UVs for their coordinates and things like that. So you can't really get away from UVs even when working with procedurals a lot of the time. Sometimes you can, but not always. Um, also, PTEX is another alternative. People always ask about like, oh, what about PTEX? Um, and I have a picture of Bolt because that was the first movie that Disney used it mostly on um, quite a while ago now. And PTEX stands for per face texturing, which means that every single face of your object has its own texture. So they might not be big textures, they might be very small, even one pixel. Um, but every single face has its own texture and its own you know, little unwrap. Um, and so you can paint like that. So 
In that case, it abstracts away the UVs, but they're still there. Um, but the reason it's not used as much for a lot of things besides you know, heavy film production is because, again, it's very resource intensive. Um, it's, you can imagine having a image for every single face of your object is pretty heavy. Um, so we were actually going to get this in Blender potentially back in 2015. A uh, developer, I believe uh, Nicholas Bishop was working on implementing it, but there wasn't enough um, need from it from the community and also there was a couple of roadblocks and so it never got finished. But the industry kind of moved on from that a little bit and it's more about like UDIMs and, and stuff now, so it's not as relevant as it was. Um, decals, another great option. Um, it works, you can, you can get away with not using UVs for some objects, uh, but it's really limited to very simple, like your, your larger areas have to be very simple um, and like very uh, low amount of procedural stuff. Um, in order for that to work, you can't, you can't decal your way around a rounded brick wall or something like that. You, you have to use UVs at some point um, for most objects. Okay, so UVs aren't going away. Uh, what about AI? Can we just have AI do it for us, which would be extremely nice. Um, that's something that if anybody has experience with, I'd love to talk to you about. But uh, the number one reason that we don't have it yet is because it's a little more niche than what people are researching right now, but also because you just need a lot of high quality models and high quality examples of UV unwraps in order for this to actually be useful. And that's something that's very difficult to get. Like we at Orange Turbine, um, like we're not just, just gonna scrape a bunch of games or you know, models off of Sketchfab in order to make this work. Like that's not a good idea. Um, so there's just not that many uh, ways to get all of that data that's actually needed. So eventually it'll get there, um, but likely not for a bit. But even if it does, right, the automatic one-click type of things probably need to be fixed a little bit um, after the fact. So you might have to tweak it and it might only be, you know, five to 10 minutes of tweaking versus an hour or so. But even so, you want a robust set of tools to do that easily um, when you have to. So even so, UV editing tools are not going away, as far as I know. We'll find out. Um, in this talk, we'll look at Blender's UV tools, how to use them as effectively as possible. We'll talk about uh, the custom workflow that I was working on, um, as well as possible improvements either to the tool itself or to Blender. So first, the easiest way to get UVs is just through projection. So this is like the simplest method. Uh, all you're doing is you're taking an angle or multiple angles and just flattening the model, looking at it from that direction and just projecting it outwards. So Blender has a couple types of projection, cube, cylinder, sphere, projecting from the view, and smart UV projection, um, which isn't like super smart, but it just bases it on the angle. Uh, and you end up getting a, a decent unwrap with minimal stretching. Um, often looks quite good, but it's you know very messy in the seams, um, can cause some problems. So it's mostly for really dense objects that you don't really care exactly what the UVs look like. Um, but in general, Blender relies much on much less on projection than other applications do. And so I don't end up using them all that often. So making seams, I'm sure if you've used UVs, you're very familiar. Just go into edit mode here, select some seams. Let's go to box select. Uh, you select some seams, some edges here, right click, mark seam, pretty quick, not too bad. Um, but there's an even faster way to do it. So that's just based on the edge menu, also control E. You can pick the shortest path, which is the fastest way to do it in vanilla Blender. Uh, you just select an edge, hold down control, select another edge, and it'll tag everything in between. If you go down to pick shortest path, set that to tag seam, you can very quickly just boom, 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 you're done. Um, so that's pretty nice, works quite well. Uh, you can't do that on a single edge, but as long as you have multiple edges all connected that you need to unwrap, then there you go. You can also select by attribute, so half of the battle is selecting the right edges to mark as seams in the first place. And you can select things based on a variety of different attributes in the select menu. Um, I'm often going to select uh, similar and using select by similar sharpness or select by beveled edges or whatever. And that way I can just select a, a sharp, sharp edge and then place a seam there for everything. Um, but you can also you know, select sharp edges like so, find an angle and mark seams that way. So that's definitely helpful. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. 
from islands, you can mark seams from your existing UV islands. So for example, if you have a default unwrap, or let's say you used one of the projection methods, if you go and unwrap your model again, since you don't have seams, all of that information will be lost and you'll have to start over. So what you generally want to do is after you've done something like that, or you have a primitive that you want to keep the UVs for, uh, you just go to the UV editor, select everything, UV, and seams from islands. And there you go. So that's also very helpful. Yeah, you're good. Um, all right. So speeding up seams. Um, so they're not very slow. We saw those tools very quick. Um, however, if you're making hundreds of cuts, thousands of cuts, if you're spending all day working on UVs, going three clicks per operation is not super ideal. Um, so what we did, and this is myself, um, but the, the bulk of this was uh, JF Matthew, who we hired to work on this, is we built a tool for placing seams just as an active tool. So uh, once you install the add-on, you just go to cut UV in the edit mode toolbar, and all you do is just click and make a seam. So very easy, um, but double click, marks a loop, just like so. Uh, you can draw seams like that, um, in case you have like an arbitrary path that you need to follow. There's the pick shortest path by holding control, all of that. Um, but the most, the thing that I'm most excited about here is that when you double click to mark a seam, it stops at the other seams. So this seems like a very minor feature and it's in a lot of other UV tools um, if you're used to working in rhizome or whatever. Uh, but the reason this is helpful, even though it might seem small at first, is that let's say you have a character, you wanna split it into sections, you can split the neck, the arms, the legs, um, the torso, and then if you want to split the sides, you just double click. Like you're just double clicking all these things, you're done very quickly. Whereas if you're just selecting by loop, you know that's going to run all the way down the legs, up the arms, around the head, across the fingers, all of that. So it's just a very easy way to split things up into sections. And if you hold like shift and double click, then it just goes all the way through if you want to. But again, it's, it's very, very quick. Um, but just marking by seam and then stopping at the seam, very important. Um, what else? Uh, seam layers. So this is something that I have wanted for a while, and that's where in Blender you have your seams. You have one set of seams, but you can also have multiple UV maps. Um, and the seams don't really correspond to the UV maps at all. They're not associated whatsoever. So if you have multiple un uh, unwraps, then you work on one, you have your seams, but then in order to work on a different unwrap that you want to maybe place a decal or something, you have to uh, get rid of all your current seams make your new ones, and then wrap that way. And if you go back to the first one, you're like, you just have to remake your seams or go seams from islands again. So that takes a while. Uh, so what we did, um, specifically JF did this one, which is incredibly helpful, is we associated seams with UV maps. So all we need to do is just mark some seams, just like so. Um, and then if you switch your UV maps, the seams are saved on the map. Um, so that just makes a lot of sense and uh, is, is much faster to work with. Um, especially, not every project needs multiple UVs on, a, on an object, but a lot of uh, game assets that I've worked on have definitely needed that. So that's been helpful. So what's the name of the tool? UV Flow. It's currently in beta, so it's not actually fully out yet, but you can find it online, or um, I'll show you a link at the end and then you can just get it and I'll, I'll give it to you for free to try out. Um, okay, so this is how the tool works for anybody who's interested in the technical details. Most of what I'm going to talk about is stuff that you can do at home. Like if you know a little bit of Python, you can replicate a lot of the functions of the add-on. However, for the active tool in the toolbar, that is not quite the case uh, because it uses the active tool API, not the most documented area of Blender, but it's, it works pretty well. However, it doesn't have a on start or on exit function that you can use. So what we had to do in order to make this work, um, as you can see, we have pre-selection highlighting and you know a bunch of context-sensitive stuff in order to make this work. So what we had to do is run this, run a state machine inside of a timer, inside of the tool, and that creates a whole lot of uh, extra little hurdles that we had to work around. Um, so it's, yeah, I, I wouldn't say it's um, ideal, but it's it's the only way that it can really work. And so it was worth the extra effort, but it did take um, I would say a good, a good few months um, in order to actually figure out how to make this work reliably. Um, let's see, it's using ray casting, we're using pre-selection highlighting, 
and it saves and loads attributes. So when you mark a seam or do anything related to UVs, it saves all that information as attributes on the mesh. And that's how we're able to do the UV layers and a couple other functions that you'll see later. So it's all thanks to the generic custom attributes. Um, one weird thing about that is that you can only set and load them in object mode. So we're working in edit mode, but we have to switch over to object mode in the script and then switch back to edit mode um, in order to make that work, but it, it does do the trick. All right, can it be added to Blender? This is something that I definitely want to think about as if you have a tool that's very useful, why not just implement it? Um, first, we're breaking all sorts of design, uh, design conventions of Blender in order to make this work because we're doing several things, we're doing them at once. Um, and so it, as a whole, no, but the idea of having an active tool that sets attributes, that makes a lot of sense. So maybe that could be added or um, some of the other like specific functions we'll, which we'll talk about later, um, hopefully could inspire features or things maybe that we could uh, add ourselves if, if we could. Um, so some specific parts might be able to be added, but not everything as a whole. It actually works better as an add-on because again, we're, we're breaking the rules in order to make it easier for the user. And in this specific case, um, it works great. So that's the beauty of add-ons. You can break the rules. It's uh, definitely punk rock that way. It's nice. Uh, unwrapping. So unwrapping has several options in Blender versus angle-based versus conformal. Actually had to work pretty hard to find an example where conformal was better. Um, you're pretty much always going to want angle-based. But if you have a very flat area that's rounded on the outsides, then angle-based doesn't work quite as well. But for the majority of cases, uh, angle-based is almost always better and gives a more uniform unwrap than conformal, which uh, can lead to a lot of stretching. So the manual says conformal is better for simple objects, but that's not quite accurate. Um, I would stick with angle-based most of the time. Fill holes is another option. It just pretends that there are polygons where there are holes. And so you get a more accurate, um, more accurate unwrap around any holes. Correct aspect, um, let's see, I don't have an example of this one, but it's where you have a non-square texture. It'll stretch the UVs to match that. Uh, you can turn that off if you want to, but it's very helpful for um, making sure that it, if you have like perfect squares in the texture, that it looks like perfect squares uh, on your model and not be stretched. Use subdiv is also very helpful. I don't use it all the time because it is a little bit slow because it has to take all the extra polygons from the subdivision surface modifier into account as it's unwrapping, but in some cases, you'll get some extreme stretching. Here's a case where I just took a plane and subdivided it. And what happens is as you subdivide it, of course that distorts the UVs and so you can correct for that when unwrapping. Um, the issue with that is then if you switch subdiv levels, right, it's gonna change um, your, the result of your UVs. So you wanna do that at the subdiv level that you're rendering at, um, which sometimes is a little bit of a hassle, but it does, it does work quite well. Okay, live unwrap. So this is one way of unwrapping very quickly and all it does is that anytime you place a seam, it unwraps the entire object. So if we have an object here, you have to turn it on in two places. You go to Options in the 3D viewport, Live Unwrap, UV Editor, UV Live Unwrap. And then anytime you place a seam, I'll just do that, go to Edge Select. Um, let's see, Mark Seam. It will should unwrap everything for you. Is that on for both? Let's see. Oh, has to, has to uh, make a change. Let's see, Mark Seam, there we go. Um, and Mark Seam. All right, so you can see it just updates the UVs as you go. So this is extremely fast, it's very helpful, but there is one issue with it which I wanna talk about, uh, I think next, let's see. Okay, so the way we're doing it is slightly different. We're using Blender's regular unwrap. Um, but we're just using generic attributes as the seams. And there's no reason that you can't use other attributes as seams as well. So in the tool, as you're unwrapping, um, not only can you have the you know, different UV layers, you can also use any other attribute um, as a seam. So you can use a specific angle, a bevel, a crease, or a sharp, or a freestyle mark, whatever you want, um, potentially custom attributes. Like it doesn't, like anything could be a seam. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to mark these as seams. They just act as seams. So if you have a hard surface object, for example, um, and you're going to bake the normals, it's really important that anything that's marked as sharp has to be a seam. Like that's just, if you want a good rounded normal map, um, otherwise you're gonna get glitches if that's not you know, on the edge of your island because you need a little bit of uh, overshoot of the texture there. Um, so to avoid glitches in cases like that, 
you know, every, every sharp edge has to be a seam. Um, and so here you can just turn that on and you're good to go. Um, so you can unwrap an entire object without using seams at all if, in some cases. Um, apply scale is something that I've also wanted for a bit. And that's where, you know, in Blender, if you scale your object, something ridiculous, uh, and you go into edit mode and you and unwrap, um, it's going to be very stretched. Actually, let me do seams from islands first. You and unwrap. All right, it's very stretched. Um, but if you use apply scale here, unwrap, uh, it'll figure it out and, and try to make it as square as possible. So the way we're doing that is incredibly simple. All we're doing is we're just stretching the object in the opposite direction, unwrapping, and then undoing that stretching. So very basic, but it does work. And that way, you don't actually have to worry about your scale as you're working. Auto unwrap. So this is exactly like Blender's live unwrap, but with one key difference. Let me go ahead and make sure that's turned off. Uh, let's see, live unwrap off, like so. Uh, it only affects the area that the seam is on. So on either side of the seam, it'll unwrap those two parts and not unwrap the rest of the object. So if we have this on, just a little like live button, um, and I mark a seam, like so. You can see that the, the face of the monkey jumped a little bit, but the ears in the other areas did not. Um, if I place the seam here, you know, that area will be unwrapped, but not the rest. The reason this is really important is because if you have live unwrapped turned on all of the time, you know, it's very quick, it's very fast to work with. Uh, but let's say you do some manual work on your UVs, you um, straighten them out, you do some relaxing, you, uh, I don't know, do whatever work you need, you put them in exactly the right place. If you mark a seam anywhere on the rest of your object, uh, all that work is just reset. It's gone. Um, so I've definitely spent time um, redoing things because I didn't realize that that was happening on the other side of my object, didn't think about it, and um, just had to redo it. So it's a very simple change. It's literally just one, one difference, um, but that will definitely save some work. So uh, let's see. Some tips for unwrapping subdivision surfaces. So we talked about the use subdiv. Of course, there is that. Um, which can help, but if you have, let's say, something like a cylinder, you add a subdivision surface, you're going to get some stretching. So the way that you fix that, um, and the reason it's happening, is actually because there's a big difference in the scale of the face on one side versus a, the scale of the face on the other side. So up here, you know, we have these very small, small faces, and here we have some very big ones, and the difference between the two is causing that stretching. So in general, if you're using subdiv, uh, what you need to do is add some seams like that, or add some like holding edges in order to fix that, and that'll that'll fix it. Uh, the problem is with Blender, the subdivision surface is set to keep boundaries, and so you're going to get this kind of stretching, and it can be very confusing if you don't know exactly what's what's happening there. Uh, and this is from the subdivision surface modifier. Um, I just put the setting up here because that's more convenient than digging through the properties editor. But all you need to do is just switch that in the advanced tab of the modifier over to keep corners and junctions. That'll solve it. Um, I had one project earlier, where was, which was like a hard surface character, but it all used subdiv. And so I was doing that for every single object of every single part of this robot, and it got a little bit old. So uh, just switching that over to keep corners and junctions when you're working on something like that can be very helpful. All right, improving visibility. Sometimes UVs are a little bit hard to see. So there's a couple things that you can do to improve this. First of all, is just use a check checker texture that's covered by many videos online. I'm sure you know how to do it, and if not, you can, you can look it up pretty easily. You just add the texture in the shader editor, make sure that's selected, set your viewport to textured, um, and go from there. But I didn't really want to think about it every single time, uh, so what we did is just implement it as a actually like zero-click thing, where you have your uh, checker and your overlays as a preference, and any, anytime you use the tool, it just switches into it. So on any object, as long as you have that set and saved in your preferences, you just switch to the tool, you're ready to unwrap, never have to think about it. Um, and I've just, I've enjoyed not having to go into the shader editor. But again, like pretty much every UV editing add-on has that. Um, so that's something that's, that's pretty easy. Um, but it's fun to do, uh, or is a little like context sensitive, so it won't change the other objects. If you're in solid mode, uh, it won't like put your normal map on the other objects, so it keeps it nice and clean. But uh, face opacity is something that's very helpful. So let's say in your image editor, you have your checker texture 
like that. Um, and then, let's see, you've got it there. I don't know where my image selector went up there. That's just gone. Um, let's say you have your checker texture and you're working with UVs. It can be a little noisy and hard to see. So what you want to do is go to Edit and Preferences. And I'm using a, a custom theme, but the default Blender theme, uh, if we go to UV Editor right there, the face is set to like something like around here. Um, and sometimes that's just very challenging to work with. So go to face, crank this up. Uh, it's much, much easier to see. Also, you can clear and pin your image. So a lot of the times, I don't really want to see the image, especially this checker texture. Uh, while I'm working with UVs, I don't really care about that. I want to see it on the model, but I don't want to see it here. So what you can do is just in the image editor, uh, you can go ahead and clear that out, and then just make sure you hit this pin button, and that keeps it from changing as you switch objects and switch um, between like which material is selected and all of that stuff. So pin that, clear it out, um, and then as you're working with your, your your UVs, you get this incredibly clean just workspace, um, and it's it's much easier to work with. So there is that. Um, and then also 3D overlays is something that was uh, pretty fun to try out. So here's an example. Um, actually used some geometry nodes on this one in order to, in order to work with this. Uh, let's see if we go to camera view. Where'd my object go? It was just there. It's gone. That's okay. Um, we can make a new object. Let's use Suzanne. Oh, now it's back. I have no idea what that was. Um, but, so we have these uh, geometry node overlays that uh, you can apply, um, and I'll show you how they work if we have the time. Um, but first, just making seams more visible. Uh, sometimes the, the default like dark red was hard to see. And so just making them absolutely uh, blinding was kind of fun. Um, but also it just looks cool, I don't know. But uh, some other like actually helpful ones are being able to see the angle stretch in 3D space instead of just in the UV editor. And so um, with the stretch information, with the grid information, oftentimes you don't even need to open the UV editor. You can just do your UVs in the 3D view. Um, and as long as you can tell there's no stretching, as long as you can tell they're aligned correctly, you don't really need anything else. Um, there's also angle or uh, area stretching, as well as you know which UDIM it's a part of. So uh, the way that that works is just in geometry nodes, um, what I'm doing is just taking the UVs, looking at the angle of the face corner, and then comparing that to the angle of the face corner in 3D space, finding the difference, and coloring it. Like it's, it's pretty straightforward, but it's pretty helpful to be able to just drag and drop that in and apply it uh, if you need to. Um, let's see, I wanted to include that with the add-on, but there was an issue with enabling the geometry viewers node, so I haven't figured that out quite yet, but uh, that, will, that will be there. Okay. Next up is straightening which is something that, let's see, it takes a, it takes a few steps, but Blender is actually it's pretty powerful. Um, what you do to straighten something, and the reason this is helpful, by the way, is you often want to make straight lines. And uh, as you're drawing, like if you were drawing a straight line across this pot here, uh, it would just be very pixelated because it's you know shifted in UV space. Um, and so it makes text harder to read. It makes um, clean lines not look very good. So if you have properly straightened UVs, you can get away with a much lower texture resolution and have it look just as good. So um, it's actually uh, very, very space saving as well. So a straight uh, UV is just much easier to pack. And so you end up getting a lot more out of your textures if you straighten your UVs. So the way that you do that in Blender, let's just focus on one section at a time. Let's look at this area here. Um, and actually, let's just look at a single row first. The way that you do this in Blender, is you have a couple of different options. First, you can align. So if you have an edge, just like so, uh, let's right click and you can align this edge vertically, horizontally, or auto, which is whatever is closest. And so you can easily, you know, right click, align auto. That works pretty well. You can also straighten things. So if you have your UVs a little bit out of whack, uh, you can take this whole loop here 
and then do a straighten, and then that'll make it into a vertical line, um, which is often helpful, but what we really wanna do is make this more grid-like and just straighten it out. So the way we do that with, is with uh, follow active quads, and I'll do that before align rotation. What you do is you need to straighten each edge of something that's already fairly uh, straight. So align auto, align auto, align auto, and align auto. Select that face and make it the active one, just like so, and then select the entire section, UV, and follow active quads, wherever that is. Also in the right click context menu. And there we go, now it's straight. Uh, now you can do whatever you need to do. And if this is tilted, um, as you unwrap it, you can also do an align rotation, which I think is fairly new, uh, but it's incredibly helpful. You can just select an edge, go to UV, align rotation, and as long as it's set to edge, it aligns it straight away. Uh, you can also align it to the geometry, which takes the local object coordinates and uses one of those axes to um, sort of try to project the, the rotation. Um, and that's pretty helpful. And then auto, I don't know why it's called auto, but it's actually just straightening the bounding box, um, which is works most of the time, but edge is like, it's very solid. It's very reliable, so I often use that. Uh, but the way to work with this on more complex objects, because follow active quads is great, but you can't do it on things that are not quads um, or things that aren't perfect grids. So the way that you do that is first you select an island, which is control L in the 3D viewport, by the way, and you set your uh, select linked to the delimit seam. You can select an island like that, or um, if you're using the cut UV tool, just uh, double click somewhere. Whoa. <laughs> Accidentally hit the space bar. Okay, let's just go there. Um, if you, let's see, double click, select an island. Um, all right, so what you wanna do is first align all of the things that are already grid-like. So if we take these faces and maybe just box select a whole bunch of them, everything that's basically a grid Just like so. Actually, we are going to do the same follow active quads thing, so I may as well straighten this first before I do the whole selection, just to make this a little bit faster. Again, align auto, align auto. This is definitely something that will be <laughs> automated because I also don't like doing this every single time. Um, okay, so if we do that, and then select everything that's a grid, just like so. Da, da, da. Probably use lasso selection, but well. All right. Let's say something like that. Then, as long as that is the active quad, follow active quads, great. Obviously, everything else um, you know, gets bent out of shape, but this one is now straight. What you can do is hit P to pin those vertices. That's going to keep them exactly there when you unwrap. It won't affect that. And then when you select everything and then you and unwrap again, it'll unwrap those into place. So the workflow for straightening something is you take everything that can be grids, you use follow active quads, you pin, you select everything else, and then you unwrap again. So again, that's several steps to do something that's it's fairly basic. So something that uh, we will definitely just make a one-click thing in the 3D viewport. Um, haven't quite gotten to that yet, but it's very high on the list of things to do because, again, straightening things is incredibly important. Uh, so that's quite fun. Uh, pinning, that's how that goes. Um, all right, packing. So packing in Blender 3.6, as we looked at before, is much better now that you can use you know, holes and concave shapes and all of that. Uh, it's, it's really, really good. A couple things that are helpful is average islands scale. So um, as we were working with unwrapping, um, with the auto unwrap, it's, you know, all of your islands are not always going to be the same scale because if you're only unwrapping some things at a time and not the entire object, then some might be, you know, bigger than others and take up the whole UV space or, or whatnot. Um, so if that happens, if we just take one section here and you and unwrap, and then, okay, it's a different scale than everything else. In order to make this textile density uniform, just go to UV, average island scale, and now they're all 
relative, uh, they're, they're the same taxable density relative to each other. And then you can go ahead and pack. So that's something that you want to do most of the time. Um, I included it in the normal packing options in the tool if you want. You can just automatically average island scale as you go. Um, but I, I do that before packing most of the time. Also, locking in the new packer is really, really great. You can go to UV, let's go pack islands. Um, and let's do bounding box just so it's faster. But you can set a rotation method to axis aligned cardinal or any. And uh, cardinal is incredibly nice um, because once you've straightened your UVs, obviously you don't want them tilted. And if you set it to any, sometimes they will tilt and then all of that work is kind of for nothing. So what you want to do is set this to something like axis aligned or cardinal. And that way it will rotate them into the best fit, but only in 90 degree increments. So that's really, really nice and one of the new features that I'm very happy about. Again, a bunch of these like very small things just add up to make such a big difference. And so that's why I'm excited about the uh, UV improvements in, in recent versions. Um, let's see. Also, locking pinned islands. You can do that. Uh, what was the other one? Oh, merge overlapping. So this is one that's also extremely helpful because what you want to do oftentimes, especially for uh, game assets and things, is you want to mirror your UVs from one side to the other, but maybe not the entire object is mirrored. Maybe you have an, uh, a character that is asymmetrical in the face and in the body, but the right arm and the left arm can be the same. So what you can do in Blender is you can mirror you the, the UVs by just flipping one side, overlapping it on the other one, and then as long as you have merge overlapping turned on, they'll operate as one unit, um, and so you can use that to pack uh, very easily. So that was something that was not in Blender before 3.6, and if you had overlapping UVs, they would just bit, get split out, and it was um, anytime you had to do the workflow of mirroring UVs, you had to pack it by hand. Um, so again, a small change, but incredibly helpful. Okay, what is next? We got margin. Um, that's something where obviously you want a little bit of margin on your UVs. The reason for that is that when you zoom out, um, you'll get uh, some artifacts right along the edges as the texture is downsampled. So let's say if we pack this, let's go bounding box, we can switch the margin. Um, oh, we can't do it after the fact. Uh, there's no redo editor for that one. But uh, you often want a value of, actually, I don't want to say it because I don't have it written down, uh, but you can go to a thread on polycount that has the exact amount of margin that you're generally going to want to have. Um, that's specifically for game assets. You can get away with less when you're working on films and things like that that aren't going to be downsampled as heavily. But um, I believe you divide your texture by 128, but I would look that up before actually doing it, but that's my general rule of thumb. Uh, and then that gives you just the right amount of margin. And that's, again, something that you don't want to think about every time. You just want to have whatever your texture resolution set that and then not think about it. Um, so that would be helpful to have. Also, packing. So this is probably the biggest one out of all of this is packing by material. Because in Blender, everything is object-based. You have your different objects. You unwrap them. Um, you export them over to whatever else you're, you're using. But if you're painting in Mari substance, anything else, uh, everything is based on, let's say, texture sets in the sense of uh, substance. But in Blender, if you're packing everything as objects, these two things don't really work together. I mean, you can do it that way, but like, you want to share your UV space. You want to share your materials. Um, and so packing by material is incredibly important and something that in Blender is a little bit cumbersome because you have to select all of your objects that have the same material Generally, you're um, selecting, you can go to object mode like so, shift G to select similar, um, and you can select, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, objects that have a similar material, or if it's not in there, then it's in the properties editor, uh, but you can select everything that has the same material as whatever the active material is. You can go into all of those objects, tab to go into edit mode, deselect everything, go to the materials tab in the properties editor, drop down to uh, select material, then unwrap, or, or then pack um, all of those things together. So it is a little bit cumbersome, but it is the way you have to do things if you're working in, in those applications. Um, and so I, again, found that slightly cumbersome. So what we did with packing is if we are using multiple objects that all have 
different materials, just like so. Um, and so we can see how these are packed. Let's go and just enable the checker texture. Okay. Um, as I'm packing these things, instead of thinking about it, uh, if we use the tools packer, we can set what to include, um, whether it's all objects or, or just the selected faces, whatever. But group by material, anytime you pack UVs, it automatically just groups all materials together. Um, and this is something that you can do in object mode as well. If I select all of these objects, object, pack, you don't have to think about it. It's just all done by material. So I don't know how that would be implemented in Blender. Like, I'm not sure how that would work as far as um, affecting different objects that aren't necessarily selected and, and all of that. Um, but packing by material is something that you definitely want to do if you're working with these other applications. Um, let's see, any other fun packing things? I don't think so. Uh, now let's look at some things that Blender might potentially change about UVs. This isn't like 100% for sure, but if you go to Blender projects, let's go to not that, not that, not that, but projects.blender.org. Uh, Daniel Bysett has a bunch of notes on here from the modeling module of what he'd like to see changed. And a lot of these are very well written and make a ton of sense. Um, the number one thing that I was assuming to be asked about afterwards is uh, sync selection, because that is one of the weirdest things about Blender and UVs and can be uh, definitely frustrating to work with at times. And so he has a proposal for exactly how it would work. Um, it could work in the future. And I would recommend giving this a read if you'd like. Um, but Essentially, if you select something in the 3D view, it would select both of the associated vertices in the UV editor. But if you select something in the UV editor, it'll um, not select other vertices in the UV editor. It'll just select the one on the uh, object. So it makes a ton of sense. And I really, really hope that this gets implemented because it would make everything much easier. Um, OK, there's also a potential improvement to uh, just the unwrapping algorithm in general. So here's an example of that uh, on, I think UV Packmaster has this already, um, but it's just an iterative approach that reduces stretching. And you can see that with a basic object, obviously there's no seams on here, so it's going to be stretched regardless. Um, but as it continues to unwrap, it just gets better and better. And so instead of the regular blender result, which would be more like this, then you get something that's much less stretched. So that's a potential improvement that could be coming, it's on the to-do list, but will it happen? Nobody knows. Um, but something that also would be amazing is this grid unwrap, where instead of having to go through and follow active quads and all of that every time you unwrap, you just hit grid unwrap and it does it for you during the unwrap process, which would be significantly better and incredibly cool. And it works exactly the same way as I outlined, which would be, you know, it straightens the grid areas, pins those, unwraps the rest as you go. Um, so that's something that could potentially happen automatically without you having to go through and align a quad and all of that stuff. Uh, more things, straightening an island uh, where you take a selected set of edges and it just straightens that out but then unwraps everything else around it. Again, very similar to how we already looked at with uh, follow active quads but instead as uh, a straightened edge rather than a grid. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, shifting things up and down. Very helpful when you're working on like low resolution images or you have, um, you have a um, atlas of textures. Um, what's that called at the moment? Like I, I forget. Um, when you have a bunch of textures all in one. Tram sheet. sheet, thank you. Yes, when you have a tram sheet, it's very helpful to just snap things up and down um, and being able to set that in Blender and just hit your arrow keys to move between those would be very cool. Applying textile density, arranging and aligning selected UV islands, unwrapping to the same bounding box. So as you unwrap, it's not taking over the entire UV space. You can actually focus on one area, which is incredibly nice. Uh, one other thing that I definitely want to add and that I, I tried to implement um, manually in the UV flow tool is as you double click an island or as you unwrap something, it focuses 
the UV editor on that area. Um, had some problems with the um, context overrides and it was crashing a bunch, so it took that out. Um, but JF said that there's a better low level solution to that, which we'll look at. But either way, being able to zoom in on something and actually unwrap and have it be right there instead of having to constantly move your viewport around, amazing. Um, stitching islands and having them um, be the right scale, also very cool. And then um, a proposal for an automatic UV seam creation tool where essentially it's just finding tool or finding where seams should go based on a set of rules, similar to what we looked at before, but a little bit smarter, smarter than uh, smart projection. So also very cool. And um, back to a particular region, which again would be pretty sweet. So they could unwrap, you know, all of your UVs in one area, leave one area empty, and then just pack to pack to just there, um, or pack to empty spaces. Also very sweet. So that is everything that I was going to talk about. Um, again, if you want to check this out, you can go to orangeturbine.com, and there's a contact form there. And if you just say, hey, I'd like to be a beta tester for this tool, again, it's called UV Flow, um, then I'll just send it to you in an email um, and you can help test it, which would be incredibly helpful because there are still a couple bugs. Um, it's also on the Blender Market if you'd like. Uh, on there, it also is, you get all of the future updates as well um, rather than just the uh, testing versions. And yeah, so that's all of the thoughts that I had on UVs, or at least some of them. I did trim the talk down a little bit. Um, any questions or things that you are curious about? Because I'm almost at time. Cool. Um, one. Yes. Eighty percent coverage. Yeah. Like uh, just packing tighter, or I. Um, I mean, I think the, the 80% is just down to the algorithm and I haven't tried implementing a, uh, packing algorithm. So I, I couldn't tell what the actual, um, way to achieve that would be, but in general, the straighter you, UVs are, the tighter they can pack. I'm sure you've already done as much as you can there. Um, you'll often see in Blender with it's like 3.6 packer. Uh, it has all of the, it takes all the small islands and puts them on the outside and you often get a lot of wasted space up there. Um, UV Packmaster does that less, but still a little bit. So maybe that's where they're getting it from is just better utilizing the boundary um, and then packing that inside the other objects rather than along the edges would be my guess, but that I don't know for sure. Um, any other questions? Okay, then for the rest of the time you can come up if you'd like to get ready and I'll just unwrap stuff for fun. <laughs>